Good morning and welcome to another edition of The Legal Zone where we tackle injustice. We have a serious injustice that's going on with our show today and we're gonna tackle that. Dr. Cheney, good morning. Good morning. John Salati, good morning. Good morning, Salon, good to be here with you. And our special guest, Ms. Athena Phillips, good morning. Good morning. And happy 4th of July, everyone. Before you. Arba Tammuz. That's 4th of July in Arabic for those who are Arabic speaking in our audience. All right, let's jump right into it. When we Today, I'm going to do things a little differently. I teach uh, legal studies at the PIW, and I'm going to do it like I do a class. Let's look at some words before we go into this. Larceny. By the way, subscribe to our channel down below. And if you have any questions or concerns, or if you have a case that you would like us to look at, you could email the legal zone at demuslaw.com. Okay, let's jump right into this. Larceny. That's a word that most people have heard of. Maybe not. Some people refer to it as theft. What is that exactly? Larceny or theft is the taking of another's property with the intent to permanently deprive the person of the property. That's the definition of larceny or theft. And it's important that you look at these definitions when you talk about legal issues because you have to meet all of the elements in order to meet a larceny or a theft. So if I'm at John's house and we're watching the game, we're hanging out and the evening time comes and I'm about to leave and I pick up his phone and I look around and I put his phone in my pocket and I walk out the door and I go home is that larceny? Maybe, maybe not. We have to look at the facts to determine whether or not larceny had just taken place. What if the phone that I took, John's phone, was an iPhone 12 Pro, and I put it in my pocket and walked out? What if the facts reveal that my phone is an iPhone 12 Pro? And then we look at the facts, my phone is still on John's kitchen table. Ah, then you see that the intent to permanently deprive John of his property is not there. I mistakenly picked up his phone instead of my phone, right? So that's how you look at the, all the elements. Another example, if I was at Dr. Cheney's house, and she fell asleep while I was there. And I noticed the keys to her red hot Lexus sitting on the table. So while she's asleep, I go, I pick up the keys and I dip out and I take her car for a joy ride. I drive it all around town for a week. Did I just commit larceny? Well, after the seven days, I brought it back. And I said, here's your keys. Then that permanently deprived element is no longer there. So being charged with larceny may not and probably will not stick. And then the common one is when you're in the store, say you're in Macy's and you see those fake jewelry hanging up on display. And I go in, I take it, I put it in my pocket and I start walking around the store. Did I just commit larceny? And Dr. Cheney, we talked about this earlier. What if after I put it in my pocket, I'm walking around, I go up to the cash register to pay for it. I was with my daughter and I didn't want her to know what I was getting her. 
So I hid it from her, but I didn't walk out the store. So these are things that you have to look at when you're talking about larceny. And this is all for why we're talking today. Another one I wanna talk about is malicious prosecution. Now, what in the world is that? We all know what malicious is. Malicious is anything done with ill intent. You do something maliciously is because you've done it with the intent of hurting someone. Malicious. We all know what prosecution is. Prosecution is a criminal proceeding. So a malicious prosecution then is the intentional the intentional act of causing someone to be incarcerated. Malicious prosecution. So again, if I'm with Dr. Cheney and Dr. Cheney says, hey, um, my car broke down. Can I use your car? And I say, yeah, no problem. And she says, are you sure? I don't wanna be an inconvenience to you. And I say, look, Please go ahead, take it as long as you like. So she takes my keys and she takes the car. And as soon as I see her drive down the street, I pick up the phone and I call 911 and I say, I think my car was just stolen. <laughs> I don't know, I, it's gone. And I think I know who might have it. So the, call the police, the police go and they arrest Dr. Cheney for grand larceny. Little do I know that Dr. Cheney was standing out in the front of my house and I have one of those little ring cameras that records everything. So at trial, she brings this recording and it shows that I loaned her the car. So she went to jail, she had her hearing and then the criminal charges are dismissed that just opened the door for malicious prosecution because I intentionally did something that caused her to go to jail. And the only way it could be proven is if those charges gets dropped. She has to have a hearing or the state has to drop the charges because they realize that the evidence that they had were not true. So that's a malicious prosecution. So anybody out there who's gone to jail wrongfully you might have a cause of action for malicious prosecution. Then the last one, before we get into this, false imprisonment. Now, what is that? That's the intentional restricting or confining of another person's freedom. You cause someone to be stuck in a position that they don't wanna be in. It could be physically, if you've ever seen the movie Black Snake Moan, the guy tied the woman to a stove. It could be verbal. If you leave this room, or it could be someone in a position of authority, a police officer and he makes you believe that you're not free to go when you truly are. And so you're stuck in that position. This, these three causes of action is what we're dealing with today in this amazing story of this young lady. So with no more waiting, Miss Athena, tell us what happened to you. Okay, um, I don't remember the exact date, but it was a day in September. Um, I wanted to accompany my friend on their errands to Walmart. Um, now, where do you live? Where do you live currently? Huntsville, Alabama. Okay. Uh, we were going to the Super Walmart in Huntsville, Alabama. Um, I didn't really bring anything with me. I just wanted to go along for the ride. Um, I didn't have, I think I only had my phone on me. No IDs, no keys, no money. I was just going for the ride. 
Um, and as we're leaving self-checkout, um, there, I don't know what the person at Walmart's called that handles these affairs, but they were at the door and they stopped uh, me and my friend and asked for the receipt. Um, when my friend handed the man the receipt, I saw that it was shorter than what was in the cart. Um, so I kind of panicked a little, but I didn't, I kept my composure. Um, the man then said, well, can you come to the back with us? Um, and I said, is there something wrong? And he said, um, you guys know what you did. And I looked at my friend and I said, well, can I pay for whatever they didn't pay for? And he told me no, that uh, we would just be going to the back. I would sign some papers and that would be it. He wouldn't call the cops on us if um, we cooperated. So what, what was he accusing you of? Theft. Okay. Um, and I said, okay. So um, as we're walking to the back, I realized we were going to the back back. Um, so I asked for a woman present. He fought with me a little bit on that one, but we got one present. Um, and then when we got to the back of Walmart, um, he didn't have any papers for us to sign. I asked him, well, where are the papers? And he said he needed information about us first. Um, so he asked for my social security and for my IDs. And well, he first he asked for my ID and I told him I didn't have my wallet and that it was in the car, but that if we went to the car, he went with me, I would get my ID and pay for whatever was missing. He said that wasn't an option. Um, so he asked for my social security number um, and I asked him if I could write it down and he said no he wanted me to say it aloud um, and I hesitated and he said okay well failure to produce ID we have to call the cops anyway I said okay um, and I said well are we being arrested and he said no they're just coming to ID you and I said okay um, they came they couldn't ID me because I don't have any tickets um, or anything on my record now, so, so wait, so at any point in time, did he tell you that he was arresting you for larceny or theft? Okay. And did you steal anything? No. Okay. How long were you in the room when he took you back in that room? About two hours. Yeah, I didn't hear. About two hours. Wow. Okay, go ahead. Um, so as we were waiting for the cops to show up, um, me and the Walmart guy talked for a bit. I asked him how much money was remaining on the ticket that we needed to pay for. Um, he checked and he told me it was about $70. And I said, there's no way I can just pay that. Um, I was like, I was reading and you guys don't usually make arrests unless it's $500 or more property stolen. And he said, that's for the state of Alabama. Here at Walmart, I can do whatever I want. Um, that's when he told me that he arrested a girl the day before for less than $5. And I said, you sent her to jail? And he said, yes. It's like, that's something to be proud of. Um, and yeah, that's when I knew that he probably wasn't gonna let us go. Um, we waited for the cops. Um, the cops also told us that we probably wouldn't be arrested and that he would let us go. I don't, I don't think he wanted to let us go um, for anything. Um, and essentially, and then when the we never signed anything. Yeah, we never signed anything. There were no papers. Once the cops came, they still couldn't ID me by name or social security number. Um, so they said they would have to take me into the station. I asked if I was being arrested and um, they told me no. They didn't say until I was in the car that the Walmart guy wanted us arrested and that we were in fact arrested now. Did they um, put you in handcuffs? Yes, we were, I was in handcuffs the entire time I was in the back of Walmart. So the Walmart security officer put you in handcuffs? Um, he detained us and then had the when the cops came, he had them handcuff us and we were back there for about another hour. 
because it took an hour for them to come. Did you go to prison? Yes. Yes. Okay. Holding. I was in holding. Dr. Cheney? Well, when the uh, security person approached you, what about the other people that were there? Was it, you said there were other folk that were there, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sorry? Because I just hear about you, but were you all in the room together? Yes. And the other person responsible for theft, um, they weren't being very nice or polite about it. Um, and they were resisting and rejecting the fact that they had stolen. Um, so I told them to stop speaking because they would make it worse. Um, the other, other thing that I was wondering why you actually, maybe you didn't do that, but it sounds as if you actually said you offered to pay without even knowing. You said you looked at the bag, huh? I didn't want to get arrested. <laughs> yeah, but how would you know what was in the bag to know that? Oh, they, they were stealing big materials. And once I saw that it, the receipt was this short, but I saw, all of, since I was shopping with them and I saw everything they were buying, once I saw a receipt this big and not this big, I knew something was wrong. But when they were checking out, I was on my phone. So I didn't see that whole swiping process. I saw the full cart and the less than full receipt. And you automatically volunteered that the receipt and the bag were not matching. Without well, the Walmart guy said, once he looked at the receipt, and said, well, why don't you guys come to the back? That's when I said, okay, can I pay for whatever is missing? Because that's the only reason they check the receipt at Walmart to make sure you're not stealing. And if they stop you because of a receipt, the problem probably isn't that they got the total wrong. It's probably because <laughs> someone was stealing. Right, because one of the questions that I really had was when, they, when you were approached, um, can you recall the kinds of internal messages that you were sending to yourself. Um, for example- uh, was to keep okay. going. Keep. I, I've worked in retail, so I know that they- okay. Yeah, when he first initially stopped us, he just bar barricaded himself between us and the door. And I know that retail workers can't do that because I've worked in retail. So I was like, that's strange. And I tried to just maneuver past him and then he stopped us again and then proceeded to ask for the receipt. And I was like, oh. Yeah, because maybe somebody made a mistake. I don't know how much time I have with you, but the other thing that I wanted to know, when the time came and you made your first phone call, mm -hmm. um, what do you say to the person on the other end and what kind of advice did you get from your go-to person on the other end? Whoever that was. Um, I told them that I got into some trouble with a friend, um, but that I knew I would be okay because I was innocent. And they told me, they asked me what I could do because um, all of my family doesn't, uh, my immediate family, they don't live in Huntsville. Um, their last words of advice were, don't tell dad. Um, <laughs> told me Why not? not? <laughs> Probably because he'd be upset. Um, but I knew he wouldn't be because I was innocent. Um, but probably immediately since at this point it was almost one in the morning um, in Maryland, yes. So um, I was like, okay. And that was the only advice that I got. So okay. to make it clear, the person who was stealing was going through a self checkout and they were scanning some items and bagging others without scanning. Yes. So that was the big, the big plot, so to speak. Now, when we got involved, John and I, 
you had a public defender at some point. Yes. And the public defender suggested that because you were, how old were you at the time? 21. The public offender defender suggested that you enter into a program and in two or three months, the whole thing will just be expunged. Mm -hmm. And my first question to the public defender was, well, is she guilty? Mm -hmm. And she said, well, we don't know. And I said, well, why would you suggest she go through a program as though she is guilty? And she said, well, it's just something that's easy and quick. And I said, okay, well, let's get the video first and then make a determination. So she saw the video and the video confirmed that you were nowhere near the person who was doing the self-checkout. Mm -hmm. And at that point is when we entered our appearance to take over from the public defender, right? So let's talk before that, that's the legal aspect and we'll talk about it later. So what were your feelings like? Have you been to jail before? No. So this was the first time? Yes. And, first how, time cuffs. and how was your feelings of having to go to jail at age 21 in Huntsville, Alabama? Um, embarrassing. Um, the, the location of where I was was right next to my school. Um, it's like the hub. If you want to see people from my university without being at the university, you go to that Oakwood. Um, so that was the only thing running through my mind was my reputation within my major and who was going to see me. And then um, once I was in the jail, I was a little bit more calmer because I knew that I was innocent and that um, I knew that, yeah, I knew that uh, we'd be able to get it expunged because I was innocent um, to the point where they didn't even feel the need to tell me I was arrested unless I asked. Um, the cops were very nice and lax about it. Um, but the entire time in the back of Walmart and from starting initially where they stopped me at the door, it was panic <laughs> um, and embarrassment. John, do you have any questions? No, no, no questions at this point. No, it's it's just one of those again, uh, you know, head shaking moments of thinking, really. But again, you know, the kinds of crazy stuff we see every day. It's like, yeah, all well, this is this is one aspect of of the injustice, right? Just the little things, the little aggressions, the little problems, and how they steamroll from there. And so. Well, let's get into the procedural portion now. So now we, we let the, Dr. Chen, you were saying something, go ahead. Yes, I want to ask a little bit more from a lay person standpoint, if I could. So we've heard about your private experience or your public experience rather. And I hear that you're in college based mm -hmm. on what you just said. What about the administration, your classmates or any of those individuals, did they find out about it? Um, they did. Um, and what happened? Well, the friend group that I had at the time, they, they were the ones that, well, initially it was supposed to just be my one best friend. She found it in her best interest to bring the entire group to pick me up from the jail. Um, and I'm not really friends with them anymore. Um, mainly because w once they picked me up at the jail and found out why I was arrested or detained. Um, they said a lot of mean things. Um, and I'm not sure if administration found out fully. My advisor knew um, and my one math teacher and they pulled me from a class because they didn't think I would have time. Um, and then there was a conflict with my first court date and I had a final that day. And um, before I switched over attorneys, my court appointed attorney and my, uh, my professor didn't care. They told me to figure it out because I shouldn't have been in jail in the first place. Um, but the entire faculty didn't know. It was, I didn't want it to be a big news type of deal. And the last thing that I wanted to ask, if it's okay, 
if you uh, if you were presented with a redo of that day, what would you what what would you do differently? What what would you have done differently? I would not have gone to the store. I can say that um, if I had still chose to go to the store, um, I probably would have paid better attention to if they were stealing and left the situation earlier. Uh, maybe walked to the car and said, yeah, I'm just gonna wait in the car while you do what you do. Um, but my attention was elsewhere. I was on Twitter. Um, so. <laughs> So let's go into the procedural portion. So now we come in and I ask for the entire file from the public defender. And I read the report from the gentleman. Now describe the gentleman to us, Athena, so we can get a picture of this. The gentleman, he was, um, he was about, I would say six feet, um, heavier set. Um, wide, broad shoulders, um, big beard, and I want to say he had on, no, I don't think he had on sunglasses. Yeah, he had a big beard and- um, Black, white, uh, Hispanic? White. He was Caucasian, yes. Okay. So the first thing I asked for is a copy of the police report, and I noticed in the police report that under oath, he said that he witnessed suspect Athena Phillips scan items and bag items without stealing. I mean, without paying. And so the charge was larceny. And so upon reading that, I contacted the client, Athena, and mm -hmm. I said, are you sure you did not steal? She said, no, I wasn't paying, I wasn't bagging. So I waited then for the video and the public defender said she saw the video and Alabama has this weird rule that you have to literally go to Alabama to see the video. Like they couldn't send me a copy up here in this DC area. I had to fly and I said, I'm not gonna fly to Alabama to watch a two minute video. And so the public defender said, that's fine. I saw it, she's not on it. So I said, hmm, remember we just talked about malicious prosecution. When you cause someone to be incarcerated wrongfully. And so the first question was, well, why would he say that when there's a video that says the exact opposite? So I said, okay. So I said, this is something that will be easy for us to fight. Um, we asked for a continuance. Then I was talking to one of the public defenders, maybe a week before the trial. And I said, uh, do you really want to move forward with this prosecution? I said, you all don't have any evidence. The video clearly shows that she didn't steal. Why, why do I have to come to Alabama to have this? And the public defender says, what video? And I said, the video, Walmart's video. He said, oh, well, they destroyed that. Really? The only bit of evidence that they could use to incriminate her, if that's what they were trying to do, they destroyed it. And he said, uh, yep. So we went back to the drawing board and we found the case law that says, if the state allows evidence to be destroyed, they can't bring any supporting evidence. And that was the argument, remember John, that we, we used. So we went to Alabama and we won. The charges were dismissed and she was free to go. Yay, Athena. So with that, thank you, Athena, for sharing your story. Thank you. And we I think going... John has something to say. Oh, did you have something to say, John? Well, I, I mean, we could probably let her go because all of this, this is an important item for Athena. You won, you won the case. Great. Excellent. Super. But there's still this arrest. And that, as we know, could haunt her for years to come, even though she said, yeah, yeah, they arrested me, but they got nothing, but it's still there. And so I guess it's important for her to know, but I'm sure you've had that discussion 
but for people listening, well, okay, what's the next step to clean that part of her record? Right, and they did tell you. What did they tell you about coming back to a Walmart? I can't. Which one? Any of them. They forever, ban they forever banned you from every Walmart in the world. They have Walmart in 11 countries. And they told you, you can't go to any of them. And they even threatened you. They said they have cameras with face recognition. Top of the line. Yeah, but lose those things. So it doesn't really matter. But anyway, yeah, so yeah. keep going. So we'll, we'll talk about that. Thank you, Athena, for your story. Um, congratulations on your victory. Thank but there's you. something else that's going on with that. And we're gonna talk about that in a minute because there's ramifications and consequences even for big corporations that do wrong. We always have to face what we've done. Uh, thank you, Athena. Yeah, good luck. Bye-bye. Let me um, remove. All right. So we have a young person who is in Walmart, minding their business, and someone comes along and arrests them for larceny, for theft. There's no evidence that they committed a crime of larceny. In fact, there's evidence that they did not commit the crime of larceny, but someone deleted that evidence. So now you have a young lady being represented by a public defender and we love public defenders. We know that they're overworked, but they don't really look into that. And now we have a situation where the charges get dismissed. There's no case. That's the criminal. What happens now? Well, first, Dr. Cheney, what are your thoughts about that injustice as a layperson? As a, woman, think, as a woman in DC, because you live in DC, right? From Virginia, kind of the South still. What's going through your mind? Well, one of the things that's going through my mind is if you're innocent, how can you continue to punish me and prevent me from going to Walmart? I'm innocent of that crime. So how can you stigmatize me and continue with this <laughs> off the books. It's like off the books, so to speak. You're treating me differently, or are you? I would wonder if there are other cases like that with a person, if, I, if I'm in Athena's position. How, uh, many, how many people that look like her at her age was sent to jail for something that they did not do? Okay, that. And then if she's innocent, she is rule to be innocent, then it's over with. Over with in the sense you can't continue to punish me from or ban me from going to Walmart. On what basis are they banning her? I mean, I understand as a private business, they can sort of set certain rules, but as a private business in a public space, you can't just say, well, you, we don't want you in our store. And not without some basis for saying, okay, yeah, you have done something wrong and therefore, okay, you're not allowed. So let, let, let's make a quick distinction. People could say something and then people could do something. My guess is they're telling her, they're saying, you can't come to any Walmart ever. Now, if she does, can they do anything? Probably not. But sometimes, especially the people who don't know better, people in authority would say things to keep people in check. Remember we talked about false imprisonment. You could say things to make people believe you, even though there's no basis for you to do it, but because you believe them, you abide and you don't wanna get in trouble. So they told her, you cannot go to any Walmart ever again. I would tell her, go to which end when you want to. What are they gonna do? They didn't put that in writing, I presume. Um, I'm, I think the initial report 
the criminal charge that they filed initially before the case went to court and was dismissed, it had that provision in there. See, my thought is perhaps Athena and there are other people that might have connections or might have money to afford an attorney. And let's say that a person like me or somebody else may not have monies to afford an attorney. And we go into Walmart and they said, okay, we're going to do something to you. Then that's a legal responsibility that we couldn't really take care of. So I wouldn't want that attached to me at all. The idea that uh, I can't go into these stores, something just might happen. And the way it is in most organizations today, people are sloppy. What happened today, later on, I could be charged again. So I would have to get legal representation to take care of me. So those kinds of things are in my mind. So let's quickly go over what we talked about earlier. Larceny, did she take anything that was someone else's property with the intent of permanently depriving them? No. No, that didn't happen. Malicious mm -hmm. prosecution. Did someone intentionally act that caused her to be incarcerated? Yes. And another element to this, wrongfully, to be wrongfully incarcerated. Let me put that word on there. Because you have to be exonerated. So Walmart potentially is guilty of malicious prosecution. False imprisonment. Now, the fact that she didn't steal anything, did this officer have the right to keep her in the room? Nope. Did he have the right to even keep her in the store? Nope. So we see that they now are guilty. Now, and I'll just say it, we have initiated a suit against them. And the first thing that they did was to secure what's essentially called a gag order. So we can't talk about the case from, from this point moving forward because Walmart has a gag order. But as you can see, based on the facts, you don't need us to say anything. You see what's wrong here. So John, now I turn to you. Where's the injustice here? And then in answering that question, apply it broadly to other areas that we see in our nation now going on what, what's the injustice here and does that apply across the board? Well, the injustice here is that authority is being used to persecute. See, there's prosecute and there's persecute. So now Athena is being persecuted by somebody with at least ostensible authority, the security guard at uh, the Walmart, and why? Um, had no basis, so now was this a profiling question? You know, why did she get singled out here? The, again, the evidence, their own evidence showed that, nope, that's not the case, and yet that didn't stop them at all. And so now there's a the question of privilege. In other words, you felt untouchable here. Well, you know, we said it, we can do whatever we want. Who's going to say anything to us? So there's a question of profiling, there's questions of privilege, which we see again showing up time and again in so many situations. So that's at least a, a start. And we see in the news, the worst of it, right? The George Floyd cases, the, the, all of these cases that we see that make the news where it involves the taking of someone's life wrongfully. But Dr. Cheney, what about those areas where someone is wrongfully denied a job or they're wrongfully denied admission into a school or a grade in school? What how does this play into that? Because this was wrong. She was wrongfully 
detained. She was wrongfully questioned. Then she was wrongfully put into prison. And unless we stepped in and fought, she would be tagged or labeled as a criminal for having done nothing. What about people who they did all that they were supposed to do and they could have been or should have been admitted or given a raise? What would make something like this happen is what I'm asking Dr. Cheney. I mean, how would, I'm at a loss, but I think that's why I said initially or a few minutes ago that it's very important that all the stigmas are erased because it depends on, it can be situational. It depends on how somebody gets certain materials about people and how they decide to use those materials against people. So it's, uh, it's a tricky scenario. And if it follows her in a job scenario, trying to get a job, if that kind yeah. of information slips out some kind of way, um, certainly can impact whether or not she could get the job or not. And more than likely she wouldn't. Uh, or she could. It depends on the situation. It depends on how the person at the end, the recipient of the information, decides what to do with it. John, you was going to say something. Well, I mean, I, there are two things. Uh, to what Dr. Cheney was just saying, that is going to impact her. Just again, I brought up before the fact that that arrest still exists and until that is expunged from her record, that alone will be a mark against her. Even if there's someone as Dr. Cheney is, is noting, well, I could choose to look at that information or investigate it, but that's already putting Athena in, in a hole that she's got to dig herself out of. And, and it's up to the goodness, the, the altruism, whatever of the other person. Uh, otherwise, I say, oh, well, this person, you know, we had to do a criminal background check or in the application says list any time you've ever been arrested. Well, she's truthful and puts that down. You know, that's going to be a hole she's going to dig herself out of. So that's one thing. But the other to your question, Salon, is these are the ways that I, I want to say what we're looking at, how race and racism play into so much of what goes on, right? This, this is one of those matters. You know, why is she being singled out? And how is this being handled? And why didn't they just let this go when it was clear they had nothing? Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's again that sense of who can make the rules and apply the rules and who we can apply them against most easily. And that, that's an issue that is, remains a problem. Whatever strides we've made, it remains a problem. I mean, the, these, the cases that you're talking about, the uh, Armand Aubrey cases in, in Georgia. You know, all right, now, you know, there it is. He got singled out as a black man running through a neighborhood, jogging, jogging through a neighborhood and ended up dead. And the system then went and fell behind uh, that whole thing, right? Well, one DA said, well, okay, I have a relationship, so I'm going to kick it to this. Well, there really isn't anything here. There really isn't anything there. Oh, well, we have relationships with these people, blah, blah, blah. And it is until it finally gets enough levels away from the local people that now, oh, maybe justice, some kind of justice will happen in the end. So yeah, this is... Um, One thing I wanna just share really quickly, Dr. Cheney had mentioned the impact. This is a big study that we're doing in the suit. How does incarcerating young people affect their adult health outcomes? There is an impact, not only in getting a job, but 
in everyday living. Your mindset is different once when you go to jail. And going back to the source of it, again, the system is what the system is. But the people involved in running the system, what the security officer should have done, one, he should have been honest enough to look and see who was doing the scanning. Maybe he missed it. So maybe to save face, you stop both of them, you take both of them back, and then you look at your own video. And once when you see the video of one person doing it and not the other, you let that person go. That would have been the right thing to do, right? But in every situation that we're talking about globally or nationally, it's the individuals in charge of running the system who tend to be crooked. So how can we fight that? How can we fight or tackle this injustice when the people themselves are the crooked ones? We have to be mindful of who we vote into office, maybe. Managing um, employers need to be mindful of who they hire, right? If this suit turns into something with Walmart, maybe there's a negligent hiring provision, cause of action. Maybe they should have looked into this guy. And if it turns out that he is a racist, if we could find that out, they could have found it out. And maybe they shouldn't have put him in that position. Abusing authority, you know, he, he's been around here, there and anywhere. And oh, well, yeah, he's got a record behind him and yet you hired him anyway, let's say. That's part of their due diligence. And yeah, it makes their life a little harder, but when these are the outcomes of your life being easier as a corporate entity, well, then that's part of what you have to deal with. You hired this guy. It was your responsibility to make sure that he's on the up and up. And, uh, and not, not in a sense become some cliche uh, on some, and, and a very negative cliche at that, you know, and, and negatively impacting the lives of other people because now you have some authority and you can use it any way you want. And the company isn't all that particularly concerned. I would love to know how many people were arrested for not stealing in a retail store like this. If you're watching, send an email, the legal zone at Remus Law and let us know, hey, I was arrested. I never stole anything. I would like to have you all explore the idea that what a lot of people think is that the security guard should have allowed them to leave the store. And then if he felt they were um, guilty of stealing, to prove it then. And prior to leaving the store, if you could explore, why didn't the security guard say something to them? without um, say something to them to suggest that you need to pay for these items? Or is it just a got you moment that you're waiting to, they're in the criminal business, so they're waiting to catch criminals? Well, I guess, or they're gonna say, it's not my responsibility to tell you to pay for your stuff. You know, you come to a store to buy stuff, why should I be, oh, by the way, you need to pay for what you, you know, this isn't the, the church basement where you can pick anything out and go with it. No, this is Walmart or wherever. It doesn't have to be Walmart and that, and on that point. And, and in the old days, they would have had to wait till they left the store. Mm -hmm. But I, I, and I'll give Walmart, and I've seen places where this is done. The fact that they say, well, let's see your receipt. That's essentially the moment. Yeah, he's got a receipt this big and he's got a bag this big. That doesn't work. Well, who's asking to see the receipt? Is it the security guard or the people that usually do that at the door? 
That's, you, that's the question. Well, there. usually there's somebody else who's doing that, but I don't know in this case at Walmart. In this case, there was a security um, officer, asset management or something like that. Is his, so yeah. basically he was watching them through the store. Yeah, he was watching it, which raises the question, if you're watching them, you would have saw that she didn't scan anything. So why say under oath, I witnessed her bag without scanning? See, that's the injustice in this particular case oh, is yeah. because this man said under oath, I witnessed suspect Athena Phillips steal and he didn't. The video would be a slam dunk. You said this and look, it shows that you didn't see what you said you saw, but now the video is mysteriously destroyed. So we can never say conclusively that he lied. We could say that the evidence suggests that he didn't. She went to criminal court and she got exonerated, right? But no one knows for sure that he lied because that bit of evidence now that we could use against them is gone. How clever, right? We would have caught you red-handed with your own device. And the public defender, how does her testimony at this point, how that's, would that So the public defender, that's another interesting fact. Months later, when I spoke to her to try to get her as a witness, she doesn't remember seeing the video. She was going under treatment for breast cancer and allegedly her memory is bad now. So she doesn't remember seeing the video or even telling me that she saw the video and then there was nothing there. So what prompted the security guard to come to the front or whatever, wasn't it the video? Either that or him watching from the side. Oh. We don't know if he was literally watching the video to watch them or he was physically watching them directly. I Real shop at Walmart. I shop at Walmart and it's rarely that you see a security guard. You just see the people at the exit who might check your receipt, might, but States are different. I see that based on what you're saying. But still with John, I would wonder what changed the law if it did that you said in the old days they would check you once you got out of the store. Is it something that changed why they do that differently now? Well, again, now it's because most, it's not that that still couldn't be possible. Okay. Now many was like that, the Costco's, the Sam's Club, the Walmart, whatever. They usually have somebody there at the door mm -hmm. asking for your receipt. They have their little highlighter pen and they, they mark it that they've checked. So that's why I'm saying they don't, they don't need to do that anymore. Yeah, back in the, the old days, yeah, okay, as soon as you cross the threshold, you've now stolen because you've gone outside the store. I mean, in other words, you could walk around that store for hours, right? Okay. Nothing is stolen still inside the building. Whatever your intent might be, until you walk out, there's no, you can't fit the definition. Right. But because they're checking what you have bought using the receipt, they don't have to wait for to get to your car and say, okay, Dr. Chain, you, know, you there, stop. Right. Okay. The way it's been done, let's say in the 70s. Yeah, okay, you've made it out to your car. Now we're coming after you because you did we we believe you didn't pay. It's it, it all goes for that intent factor because you could be walking around the store and say, Oh, I was intending to pay. That's why I didn't leave yet. Mm -hmm. But if you walk out the store, it's harder to say, mm -hmm. I intended to pay when you're in your car and you're about to drive home with the I items. Um yeah. So right now the burden has sort of shifted at that point, right? The burden sort of shifts from the store to the customer in terms of 
the intent. While you're in the store, well, you can't accuse me of stealing anything because I'm still here. What did I take? But as soon as I <laughs> cross the threshold, now the burden shifts to me to prove that, oh, I didn't, I really wasn't stealing something. Because now you've gone outside the purview of where you're not going to pay for it in the parking lot. That kind of thing. And by the way, of course, we always want to remind folks, if you're having questions and stuff, let us know, but also subscribe below. And you know, hit the subscribe button. That way we know uh, what, how, who is involved. And also as a reminder of all the uh, shows that we will continue to have on issues of justice. I'll throw that in there. And we don't just do family. The first, what, four episodes we were talking about family, we do other things. And we have an interesting case coming up with a gentleman who was wrongfully placed on the sex offender list. So you don't want to miss that. That will be coming up. And we have other interesting cases. And it's across the board. Wherever there's injustice is when we step in and we deal with it. Thank you all for watching. And we will see you next time. Thanks a lot. Thank Goodbye. you. Goodbye. All right. Bye bye. Thanks for watching our video. For experienced legal services in Washington, D.C., Alabama, and Washington State, visit our website at remuslaw.com or call us at 1 833 329 1799.